you could do a ton. You could do a ton in 60 second TikTok videos. It's called, you can peak interest for them to click the URL in your profile to listen to the one hour podcast. Almost all my social content is just a gateway to the longer form content and vice versa. They work together. So to me, the 60 second content is the marketing. You know, it is the setting up to the longer form. You know, I think a lot of people who have serious content have overly disrespected social because they understood that they couldn't fit it all into that package. You know, no business can fit all of its information into any marketing. The marketing is there for you to go deeper. With the lack of friction in the internet world, it's there for you. I like the, I like the point you made about school doesn't teach what the students need to no, that's the whole premise of the class I teach at Stanford is like, here's the real stuff you need to know. Correct. And but you can only swoop in and do how many physical classes? Yeah, exactly. Correct. And, yeah. and like the window's small. Whereas when you make media for the modern web, you can go deeper. You can, you can create very narrow conversations with a guest or guests. Mm -hmm. It really matters. So how, how about, so one of the guests I have that's a common recurring is like someone who's 26 and they just took over running a business. That's the most common sort of people we employ. We have hundreds of those people at Alpine. Um, we probably have 150, like 20 to late 20s, early 30 year old somethings that run companies. Is that an audience? Like do you think there's a big enough audience to people who want to hear that? Yeah, and I think, you know, kind of like, you know, I'm in a very good mood today because my Jets pulled off a miracle. <laughs> so when I think about the NFL, you think about the two conferences. When I hear you say that, I'm like, yeah. And there's two groups of people. There's the people that want to go into private equity and be in a place where they eventually are part of a firm that they maybe have to jump in and run it for a little while, jump out. And then you have an enormous uh, audience of family business operators, uh -huh. right, who, are either kind of old school driven like I am, which was your, I was operating a family business that I knew from day one was a family business forever. Then you have a different subgroup of family business operators who are coming in to run their family business and the parents have said, and they've said to themselves, I'm gonna operate this for exit within the next 10 years. That's already another subgroup, within, that's almost like a division within a conference, using the football analogy. So I think yes, comma, there's some significantly interesting subgroups within that group. 25 year olds to 35 year olds to run a business is like one of the biggest groups in the world right now. Mm -hmm. Most people out there think of it actually as VC Mark Zuckerberg, right? Like kids that raise capital. Mm -hmm. I would argue that that's the smallest sector. The far bigger sector is family business takeover, and then you have another small sector similar to VC backed, which I think is private equity DNA, where the person goes into it knowing that they want a couple of chapters, maybe one, two, or three bites at the apple of being operators um, at some point in their lives. And then that content over indexes for former operators in their 50s and 60s who've joined private equity with a 50% thinking that I might have to do one more at bat and go take over and run something when the operator can't do it after we make the investment. And those themes for that 60 year old may not be the same for that 27 year old, but there's probably a 50% crossover of content which creates audience and interest in the subject matter. Yeah, I love that. Maybe. Like for example, it's back to playing chess or counter punching or mixed martial arts. It's really chess. I was creating content I didn't know that I was gonna go down parenting themes. It was a reaction to who was resonating with my content, which was parents trying to understand why their kids were resonating with my content, initially thinking they didn't like me because of the cursing or the energy, and then finding themselves overvaluing me. I mean, my inbox now, has, in the last seven years, has gone from parents being mad at me and saying, stop cursing, stop telling my kid not to go to college, <laughs> to in the last 24 months, you're the only person my kid's listening to. You're, you're actually pushing the agenda I want them to. Please keep doing it, don't ever stop. Nice. And I think for every content. Well, your content's changed a little bit too. Well, it evolved, yeah. it changed because I was listening to the yeah, yeah. emails. I was like, yeah, yeah. wait a minute, you know, and some of it was doubling down. When the parents were pushing, I'm like, you're pushing for the wrong thing. You, it's very real and you'll feel this as you start to grow. Direct message number one, hey Gary, like, you're a real menace. Like, stop doing this. You're like telling my kid not to go to college. Who the fuck do you think you are? Next DM, hey Gary, 
my, I'm in deep depression. I'm now on a lot of medication and starting to use alcohol and drugs because my parents are making me go to Yale and I want to be an artist. You start reading that over and over and over again, you become more invigorated to say fuck you. <laughs> you want to help these kids. Because then what, and by the way, I just painted you two, I didn't paint you the full diamond. Then the ninth message is, Gary, I have a problem. My kid is in big trouble, they hate me, and I think some of the stuff you're talking about might be why. I over pushed them to be an engineer, now they won't speak to me. Like, what do I do? So all of a sudden you're sitting in this place where you know you have gift of gab or communication skills, and by the way, I felt this 10 years ago when my audience was so small, nobody knew who the fuck I was. It doesn't take much to feel compelled when you're reading this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me switch to that. Please. Um, So the other other area that I have a ton of energy for is just like personal growth. Yes. So like if I, like my really short story is I grew up in a blue collar town. Yes. Single mother. Yes. And uh, I started listening to these audio tapes. Yeah. Like uh, Tony Robbins. Yeah, of course. Brian Tracy when I was mowing lawns. And it like I made you believe doing the stuff they said, and it worked. Like it actually, like little by little, started hitting all these goals. Yes. And I feel like I feel like that content is kind of missing, or it's getting lost in the noise, like on the platforms at least that I'm on. So I have a lot of energy to bring that, some of that content because it was hugely life changing for me. So I'm thinking like I, I I haven't been. I mean, I don't know how much you can do in 60 second TikTok videos. Over. Well, what you There's could do it, what form, you could do you know. a ton. You could do a ton in sixty-second TikTok videos. It's called. You can peak interest for them to click the URL in your profile to listen to the one-hour podcast. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Almost all my social content is just a gateway to the longer-form content, and vice versa. Mm-hmm. They work together. So, to me, the sixty-second content is the marketing. Mm-hmm. It is the a moose boosh, you know, it is the setting up to the longer form. All, you know, I think a lot of people who have serious content have overly disrespected social because they understood that they couldn't fit it all into that package. Well, you know, no business can fit all of its information into any marketing. The marketing is there for you to go deeper with the lack of friction in the internet world, it's there for you. And you think the long form is a podcast? I think the long form is a very personal self-awareness framework of how one communicates best. Malcolm Gladwell communicates better in the written word than he does in audio and video. For me, I'm incapable of communicating in the written word. My employees know when I send a company-wide email, they're like, our CEO can't spell. <laughs> like, why are we here? You know, and so, no um, you know, and so, and so I think, um, Look, for me it is very clear that video is the most powerful medium, and that's been proven. But Howard Stern did just fine on radio, and Rush Limbaugh, and many others built their brand in that of sports radio, Mike and the Mad Dog, and then there's the written word, and Harry Potter's profound, and Malcolm Gladwell's profound, and Michael Lewis, and so I think that's a game of one's capability and then I always tell people also focus on what you like to do. You might be a better writer, but you actually enjoy making videos. You're probably better off doing, well, the answer is always both, but you're better off probably end of the day if you can only pick one to do video because if you like it, you'll do it. And then how do you, like you've got a number, I, I'm in a similar situation with you. I have a lot of interests that are actually like not creating Scattered. content. Yeah, yeah, like I'm building a, a private equity firm. Yep. <laughs> I'm teaching. Uh, a class which takes a tremendous amount of time and then how do, how do you think about those priorities versus like the content that you're creating and I know for I believe every human being has an hour that they don't think they have so is that really what you it takes an hour you think yeah it all depends on the emphasis you know w- Luckily, given that you're in the private equity business, you may have the resources to, you know, for a lot of people watching, they may not have the financial resources to make it an hour. When I used to do all the editing and all the, you know, it didn't take, not the, by the way, all my editing was record, stop, post. I became an improv, no editing, no lighting, no audio maker with Wine Library TV because I didn't have the didn't capabilities have or the money to hire someone to do it. Right. I did that for seven years. People forget that part. They only see the end. They don't see that journey, which is, so for you, 
Yeah, can only, you, which is why it's so great to host a show because you're in the business of getting the content and bouncing off of it yeah. out of the person that's with you. So it become, it's not like teaching a class where there's prep. What do you it, mean by that? What I mean by that is you, if you're interviewing a private equity executive or schooling executive or some other interests you have, mm-hmm. surfing, wine, baseball, whatever it is, you're just, inter- you know, Scott Boris shows up and you're like, Scott, how'd you start your career? Right. If, as long as you have the capability to react to the words that they're answering, you have a very meaningful podcast. Right. Obviously, there, I'm very off the charts improv, clearly, which is why a lot of them have top 100 podcasts. There are people who do real prep work to ask the best question. When I did How You Built This, I was like, Jesus Christ, he knows more about me than I know about me. <laughs> so clearly there are different versions, but in the spirit of being busy, if you're able to get interesting people and you feel comfortable in having conversations, and I already know that about you in the limited interactions we have, I think you're structured to not have to put in a lot of prep time, just the seven to 10 basic questions, if you're able to bounce off of what they say, should lead to a very interesting podcast. Mm-hmm. And then in terms of just like building, in, in from your perspective, I mean, is your goal of your podcast, the podcast itself, is it the content you get from the podcast? that you're pushing out is a little bit of both. both. Like, and what, um, in, in terms of the podcast itself, how have you thought about just growing that itself? Well, I mean, I think when, you know, to me, the circle works together. Right now, we're in such a great era for creators because we're living through the TikTokification of all social media, AKA, for a decade, you had to build a lot of followers to get anything seen. Now, your first piece of content be seen by a million people. That's profound. So now we're in a whole different world where if you do a podcast, the clips get posted on TikTok and and YouTube Shorts and Instagram Reels, which I think is gonna start following for a bigger virality kind of gap. What I mean gap is instead of all your Reels getting somewhat the same amount of views, now you'll start seeing some things go viral, but the the views you're getting are declining because they have to have those views for the virality. If in that copy, your entire Instagram Reels profile is listen to the podcast and the podcast is the default URL and in the post-production of that Reels, there's a logo saying listen to the podcast, you're using the content that you got from the podcast to drive to subscriptions for the podcast and it becomes a viral loop. All right, here's a question. I'll let you probably not when you get asked a lot. So let's say say you had some actual marketing dollars to put behind this. Would you, where'd you put, where would you put them? I would put them in the place where the person wants the audience. So for you, there's very two clear things on what I know so far. The debate would be, do you run TikTok ads because they're very underpriced Yeah. for general awareness? Mm-hmm. Or do you run LinkedIn ads for very targeted business purposes? And the answer is probably both. Mm-hmm. And so you do ad, what about like, I don't know if people do this, what about like pay, X dollars to get someone crazy on my podcast. You know, I, I mean, I'm sure people, I'm sure people do it. I haven't really looked under the hood. I'll say something really funny. You would be flabbergasted. How many people say yes to the most random podcast that have no listeners. (laughs) And you have actually something to bring to the table because when they Google you, they're like, whoa. And if you think about a celebrity, a person, you know, the finance, the private, like these are things, you know, most of the people that have become successful didn't get there by accident, right? So a Ryan Reynolds team actually seeing that email from you, like be on this podcast, to me is like, you'd be surprised how much that might be in play, given that, you know, the the gin, he's just so entrepreneurial, he just might think it's a good use of his time. Yeah. As long as you have the humility to deal with a lot of no's and even just hearing, mowing lawn and blue collar, that tends to tell me that you probably do. Then you're cruising in a game of just asking 35 people and then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You reach out to the 55 people that you most want, none of them reply, you do it one more time, one of them replies, now they become the name that you email the next 54 back and be like, look, we had Malcolm Gladwell on the show, you know what I mean? And so, I, you know, you know I, I feel paying a guest is probably something that's going on a lot, something I'm completely unaware to giving any advice yeah, on, because yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. No, I, I, I'm but, unaware But it's probably a de- worth a debate, comma, I just have a funny feeling. If you're talking, 
Business world, a lot of people will say yes, even the biggest CEOs in the world. Pop culture, fame world, because of what you do for a living, I still think you get 5% return on reach out and that will be enough to get the flywheel going. Love it, I love it. All right, what about, I don't know how, I'm, I'm I time's keep it? going, but it's 10.30. You, I think yeah. this is it, but let's sneak this one last All one right, in. Last one. Okay, so um, what about some kind of like, if I took, I've combined a number of these different topics and said, okay, I got a lot out of this content I listened to when I was mowing lawns. I'm a professor and I built like some kind of course. These have never seen it in like, I mean, those, I don't need to sell it, but just like, is that, if, if, that, if that, you don't need to sell it, I don't need to sell it. Then I'm really into it yeah. because I think if you sell it, I don't need it. No, I need yeah, zero. Yeah, I know you don't need to. Yeah. If that makes you, like, if that's something that you, th- you know, for me, because I'm so, um, I'm not, you know, it's funny, I believe in education more than anything. Structured education feels so foreign to me, it's mm-hmm. all osmosis. And so, but every time we do anything on Team Gary that's even remotely structured, like a deck or something, it crushes. So I'm always like, have these like, I laugh with myself, I'm like, I really gotta force myself. Even my last book, I tried to make a, a like workbook and like a textbook, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I well, just couldn't get there. Cause, but for you, it sounds like it's gonna be easy to do that, and I think that would go quite well. Um, and then on that, like, you know, the, the thing, this is the last thing. Yeah, no worries. What I, one of the things I struggle with is like, I, I think some of the, some of the stuff you, you say and someone listens to, there's an impact, but then there's also a part where they need to do stuff. Well, that's they right. Actually take the action. And that's, that's what I'm trying to, I think the content. Th- now you're talking about why I produce more content than almost anybody on earth. I believe the way someone takes action is I do actually think there's a whole group that is so literal that if you say go take the course that works for them, for me, it's the constant barrage of it. Just hearing it over and over. And I over fully again. believe that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I fully believe that. Yeah. When I wanted to get more into physical shape in my late 30s, I just consumed a lot of that information. Most of all was me forcing myself talking to me about the guaranteedness of me living 20 years less and I just pounded it into my skull on every flight for six months and then I finally did it. I think most people really do after constant barrage of information. Okay. Which is why I say the same shit over and over and over in 100,000 different ways in 100 different platforms. All right, this really is the last question. Is there any risk of going like off-brand, like no. if I start? Off-brand is a, is a structure that is taught in marketing schools that have nothing to do with real life. Okay. What in theory is off-brand? As a matter of fact, off-brand is when people most start to enjoy things. Okay. When Martha Stewart went off-brand and hung out with Snoop, she became more interesting, not less. Okay. Off-brand is only bad if what you're doing is upsetting people. Okay. But if you start talking a ton about surf, I keep, I don't know what. Fitness. Fitness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's going to be an additive. Okay. You know, I mean, you're talking to a person who's most done that. Right, My, this post might be about, literally about something very narrow business and the next one might be me screaming my head off because the Jets won and I'm not worried about that. That's, that's part of the equation. I got it. I actually think it's a strength. I loved your- Especially, I'm sorry? No, I just said I love your, you had a post on that where you said that when you first go off brand, people are like, well, what the hell do you know about this? I remember- <laughs> Stay in your lane, why? Dude, this was huge for me. Yeah. I mean, I was so deep in wine world, I started talking about business, everyone's like, stay in your lane, wine boy, and I was like, I was like, right. I'm a no, businessman before I was wine boy to you. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. I, you know, I, the lane is your truth. Yeah, I like that. You well, know? Hey, thanks so much. You're welcome. Looking you forward to it tonight. Right. Yeah, we'll talk later. All right, take care.